Psychoanalysis and Philosophy, Sankhya and Heat. Namaste. Sankhya is an eternal edifice in Hindu philosophy. Shri Krishna refers to Kapil Muni, the propounder of Sankhya Darshan, as the Muni among Munis. Sankhya and psychoanalysis, how can the two be related in concept and practice, is our conversation today with guide Himanshu Vaidyaji. Namaste, sir. Namaste. Just a background on Shankhya. Can we start with that, sir? Shankhya Darshan is among the six darshans which are fundamental to Hindu spirituality. In fact, if you go slightly more rigorous and deeper, you will have to add a few more darshanas like the Sikh darshana, the Jain, the Buddhist, but by and large, in the traditional view, the six core darshanas, one of the six core darshanas is Sankhya. We have to spend a minute here on the word darshana. I'm so sorry, sir. Can we pause? There is. So if we cast it slightly wider, we would have to include uh, darshanas of Jains, Buddhists, maybe even the Tibetans, the darshanas of Tantras, Agoras and so on. We were trying to put a finger on the word darshana, which is very different from the two traditional words used in the West, that of spirituality and philosophy. Because darshan means that it's a complete package. And in that package, we would have a spirituality, mysticism, philosophy, uh, cosmology, the journey of universe. So, in a sense, it is a uh, it's a model, uh, or you can say it's an in an essential way. There is a theory of everything, and every darshana. Therefore, has its own spirituality, its own mysticism, its own cosmology, its own uh, axiology. Axiology meaning the science of values. Yes, its own ontology, which is to do with science of origins. Its own teleology, the science of purpose. Okay. And from there, its own ideas on how education should be, how mm. culture should be, how... Uh, politics should be, how economic should be, and so on. So it's a one full package. So, for example, if you look at the Buddhist darshana, or uh, everything would be there. He would have his own idea of, say, for example, take Jain darshana. It has its own idea of how the universe is, what how the origin was, what, a, what the purpose is. And therefore, how should education be? How should culture be? And so on. And obviously, that also includes ideas on psychology, ideas on pathology, ideas on therapy, and so on. So we have here, in that line, one darshana among the six. So there are six core darshanas, and one of them is Sankhya. Now, Sankhya Darshan essentially is based upon 25 elementals. So, it explains everything around in terms of 25 variables. The 25 core variables, they constitute the Sankhya system. It's called Sankhya because it's basically a Sankhya, a number. And the number is 25 in terms of which everything else is explained. So, these 25 are the elementals. And uh, the popular thing about Sankhya that people know without knowing the details is the idea of Purush and Prakriti. The Purush and Prakriti idea actually goes back to Sankhya. And because of that idea which is relevant both in philosophy and in spirituality. And in spirituality it extends to self-healing in case of psychotherapy. And that is where the Purush Prakriti principle 
along with a few other principles of Sankhya, become relevant to psychotherapy, including psychoanalysis. So this is what uh, we can start with the Sankhya Darshan. And it's an elaborate Darshan of uh, explaining the human being and the world around him and the origin and the purpose of both and also giving a way forward to some goal which according to Sankhya is the right goal. So this I think we can just have a primer to start with. Sankhya Darshan is very elaborate. It would take years to actually master it fully. And we can also see that at what points we can differ from Sankhya. We'll come to it later when we talk about it. But to start off, this can be a primer into Sankhya to then take off into more discussions. Vast and expansive as it appears. Is Sankhya Darshan then a theory of everything? It How is. would you elaborate? It is. Now, theory of everything, all cultures have theories of everything. All religions, by and large, have a theory of everything. Theory of everything, when we say, we must make a difference between essential theory of everything and a comprehensive theory of everything. Essential theory right. of everything is generic. That can be done. Comprehensive theory is far away into the future, if at all. So, a theory of everything will tell you what uh, liquid when heated becomes vapor. But if you ask, if I raise the pressure to 5 bars, at what temperature will mercury convert into vapor? Now that kind of specific question, no theory of everything will tell you. Because when we say theory of everything, it is not a theory of all the specifics, all the details. It's a theory of generic principles. So it's an essential theory. It is not a comprehensive theory. Because if you were ever to attempt a comprehensive theory, you will need encyclopedias and encyclopedias to contain the millions of facts. In oh, the okay. universe. So when we say theory of everything, we have to be clear that it is not into science. The theory of everything essentially we are referring to is a philosophical theory and an essential theory of everything. In science, what they are attempting a theory of everything is a theory into physics, a model which will explain all the forces of nature, which by no means is predictive or is certain to explain origin. So the scientific theories of everything has a very different approach and different context altogether. And even there, right. the theory of everything in physics, even if you have it, it is still in terms of essential physical principles, not accounting for all the facts that those principles can produce. So the first thing is, is Sankhya a theory of everything? Yes, it is. It's an essential theory of everything. And similarly, in India, we have a theory of everything in the Vaishnav Darshan, in the Tantra Darshan, in the Aghor Darshan, in the Jain Darshan, and in many um, Darshans which have been rendered into poetry, say for example, Sharmindu's Darshan comes out in his epic poem Savitri. And like in all epics, it starts before the origin and goes to the end or the purpose of the, of the universe. Right? So all classical epics have this tendency of saying something about the origin of the universe, going through some events and moving to say something about the final goal of the universe. And that way Savitri also becomes one. Before we end uh, the this question, just one comment. There has been a lot of discussion about Sankhya, whether Sankhya is theistic or atheistic. Mm -hmm. And this is different from being Astic and Nastic. Because uh, uh, so let us look at this too. Does Sankhya believe in existence of God or no? Many people say he does not believe in the existence of God. And some people say that 
he believes in the existence of God, he only says it cannot be proved by logic. And there is a very famous line of his which people have taken up. Uh, it goes something like this, Ishwara Siddha. Means, Ishwar cannot be proved. You cannot, so Siddha yeah. nahi sakte. Okay. So he said something, Ishwar, Ishwar ha Asiddha, aisa kuch hai Sanskrit mein. There is something mm -hmm. from that time, Ishwar Asiddha. And that was taken up to me in that God does not exist. And therefore, Sankhya Darshan essentially is an atheistic Darshan. Interesting. But uh, one great commentator, Swami Yukteswar, he says that this is actually a theistic proposition. It only means it cannot be proved. It does not mean it does not exist. And according to him, Sankhya makes a distinction between what exists and what can be proved. So in those esoteric realms, what exists, it's possible we may not be able to prove it. So this is one part about it. And the second part is with regard to Astik and Nastik, that Sankhya is definitely an Astik. Now, this is very different from being theistic and atheistic. Uh, in the Hindu tradition, Astik only means one who believes in Veda. Yes. And Nastik is one who does not believe in Vedas. Now, you can have a person who believes in Vedas but does not believe in God. Absolutely. He is an atheistic Astik. <laughs> a strange term for most of us. So many people believe that Sankhya, in that sense, most people believe he is an atheistic astic. Whereas some believe that he is actually a theistic astic. Mm -hmm. So fascinating. What is the origin ontology in Sankhya? Uh, the ontology of Sankhya is also, there are many schools upon it, so it's debated. But uh, like those who say he's atheistic, start from the gunas. Mm. That Prakriti has gunas, or some people even say gunas go on to create Prakriti. Okay. And then the Purusha. But most people believe it this way. Most people believe that uh, Sankhya's ontology starts with Purusha. That Purusha becomes a part of the Purusha, becomes Prakriti. And then in the Prakriti, there are Gunas. And from mm -hmm. the Gunas, one line goes, one line goes on to make the elements of nature. And another line goes on to make the Manas, the mind. Mind of the nature. And then the mind in turn governs the senses. And the senses come in touch with sense objects which exist and the sense object in turn are made out of Panch Mahabhuta. So, it's like if you want to simplify, say we as a system, we have five senses. So, the five senses are five elements. Now, these five senses can get in touch with only corresponding elements like the ear right. can get in touch with something to hear, sound. Mm -hmm. So, there is sound, there is light and so on. Right? So, there are five sense organs and five elements in the universe which the sense organs can sense. And these five elements in the universe are coming from Pancha Mahabhuta. Agni, Vayu, Prithvi, Jal, Jambakash. So, Pancha Mahabhuta Leading, giving, giving rise to the five elemental elements. Elements. Yeah. Sound, light and so on. And they in turn come in touch with five senses. And these five senses have the power to do action in all these five areas. So there are right. punch indriyas, the karma indriyas, panch karma indriyas, right. the five right. karma indriyas. So this becomes 20. Five punch right. five, five elements, sense elements, five senses, and senses. five mm -hmm. uh, actions. Parts of senses which are actionable. Can... Yeah, so five of them. The, the ability right. to execute action in those five areas related to each of the senses. So 20, and then five are above, like the Purush, the Prakriti, the Gunas, the Mana, the, the Manas, and so on. So 
this five are like the core parts of the psyche so to say and then you have the senses and then the sense elements and the sense action parts and the mancha mahabhuta so total you have 25 elementals 25. and in terms of this 25 elementals sankhya uh, describes everything and okay. uh, the most common ontology that people talk about in sankhya some people have a difference but most commonly accepted is this that there is a pure consciousness purusha which becomes partly prakriti and then the gunas come about and then the panch mahabhutas come about and then the uh, elemental elements come about and then the life comes about and the senses come about and so on so you explain the path of evolution in this way that how from purusha you come to a person who is entangled in maya and therefore the this person who is entangled in maya who has to come out of it has to find purusha within himself because part of the original purusha is within him yes sir this is part of the yeah so inside of him there is purusha prakriti and as he finds himself he finds in a state where purusha is by and large captured by prakriti so then the way out is how to separate the purusha from prakriti keep observing the prakriti and slowly be free from it so basically the formless how it combines itself and plays in the cosmic dance and takes up a form and how that form actually goes back into the deeper formless version which is fundamental to one's existence yeah it's the pure consciousness which is entangled completely in maya extricating itself from maya by spiritual work so the evolution is in this way and then you have to go back in some way not back but like they go higher to really extricate the purusha out of the prakriti so to the core of it yeah to the core of it the so seed how, yeah so this is how he sees uh, the source the so from the source getting source to where he is and then finding the part of the source small part of the source in ourselves that is roughly speaking and then there are intricacies and all of that but roughly speaking we can over in a simplified way we can put it this way beautifully explained sir thank you for that uh it's becoming more interesting so can we go to what then becomes of axiology here uh axiology or the science of values that in the context of this darshan becomes like this the purusha is entangled in maya and sankhya accepts all the traditional concepts of indian spirituality of of soul of reincarnation of uh, uh, karma of maya of enlightenment or mukti so the core concepts are accepted by him the authority of vedas also is accepted by him and uh, the axiology in his darshan becomes like this he place places a very strong emphasis on the three gunas the sattva rajas and the tamas and according to him the maximization of sattva and minimization of tamas and the optimization of rajas is what should be the value system so in his axiology the moral good is to maximize sattva minimize tamas and optimize the rajas and in terms of purusha and prakriti it is to be on the side of purusha and slowly try to master prakriti and in order to do it one has to take into account a complete lifestyle so that the sattvic element is maximized because if the tamasic element or the rajasic element is very heavy right, they are on the side of prakriti and they help the prakriti to enmesh the purusha even more so the axiology then becomes maximizing the sattvic element minimizing the tamasic element optimizing the rajasic element and in terms of moral value it becomes more on the side of purusha less on the side of prakriti and prakriti. the uh, in action 
high value and regard is placed on the act of observation inside, where the Purusha is observing Prakriti. And this mere act of aligning oneself with one's Purusha and observing the Prakriti in oneself, that in action terms is thought of to be of a very high good, a very high moral virtue. So this is how in various areas, the exology of uh, this darshana works out. Still, what you explained, it still shows some kind of polarity there where the Purusha is there and the Prakriti is there. Uh, maybe I'm mixed up in my mind with the version of Shiva and Parvati. That is how we have concretized these two versions in humanly form to understand it in a better way. Right. Uh, so when you talk about uh, this, uh, it seems like still seems like a polarity, you know, where the Purusha is the core and the Prakriti is the, the cosmic play. This is the cosmos and this is the cosmic play, right? So the you become an observer, the witnesser, the drashta of both of them till the cosmic play merges into the cosmic. It, does it take takes us back to the union of two or the dissolving of two? Uh this is more on the lines of liberation. Okay. Like uh, this darshan is more towards the liberation rather than of dissolution and definitely not of transformation. So if you, we have discussed before the path of the yes and the path of the no. Right? the path of liberation and the path of transformation. Yes. So this is definitely not a path of transformation. Within uh, of course, initial transformations have taken place. The ultimate version is where it is the liberation. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Uh, when I say the path of transformation, okay. I am not meaning that there is no transformation inside. I am only saying, say for example, take let me take an example. Say there is the Buddhist darshan and Sherbindo's darshan. Mm. Now, in both the cases, you have to be free from the karma and desires. Right. Which involves a series of transformation, long years of transformation. Right. That is common in both of them. Mm. Right. Now, what is not common is, Buddha fundamentally believes that it is futile to change the environment of this world. Mm. No matter what you do, misery always will be there. And the only way out is to liberate the soul from the compulsion of having to come here. But here, as it is, will not change. That the laws the of... The Prakriti remains the same. Sorry? The Prakriti, remains the... the Prakriti remains the same. Correct. The laws of nature and the nature of things as we call it will always be the same on this planet. And... It is not possible to convert this earth into heaven. Earth will always remain earth, a place of struggle and misery. And the only way out is really to get out. So, in order to get that liberation, to be free from mm. desire and maya, hundreds of inner transformations have to happen. I am not referring yeah. to that transformation. I am referring to the transformation in the outside world cannot be transformed. Uh. Whereas the Aurobindo believes, like in the Vedas, that it is possible to make earth and heaven equal and one someday in future. That the laws of nature are not static invariable. The laws of nature also will change. And the fundamental nature of man will change. A new species will come. We may not be the last species. And therefore, it is possible to attempt transformation of nature end of human life and not in human life transformation of life and into a superhuman form it is somewhat like when, what we when we see the sat yuga where the sat, sat gun is more satvik guna is more humans are like demigods and goddesses uh, right yeah. is he referring to somewhat that an extent of uh, transformation of species and the prakriti Transformation of species and prakriti, yes. It does not talk in terms of yugas in that sense, but definitely talks about evolution going forward and not stopping with us. That the evolution is on and we are not the last species. Mm. And the laws of nature are not 
uh, invariable. Static. Yeah, static. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to a very different kind of uh, darshan that it is a path of transformation of the world. It is not a path of liberation. Like in Sri Aurobindo's yoga, uh, attaining state of no thought is step number one. Experiencing the psychic is step number two. Experiencing oceanic oneness with universe is step number three. And step number four is to go into higher states of mind and bring them down into the body and transform oneself. Now that's a very different kind of thing. Then to mm -hmm. say, I will go into an observer status, all the thoughts will fall, slowly I will be free from all the thoughts and desires and when the time comes, I will go out of the body never to come back again. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a path of liberation where you don't talk of transforming nature. Whereas the darshans of transformation, they talk about transformation of nature. So in that sense, Sankhya is more a darshan of liberation rather than of transformation. So in that sense, I said ki it is uh, more a uh, libera uh, liberation than of transformation. And mm -hmm. uh, but unlike the Shankara school, the emphasis is not so much on uh, merging with the Brahman. So the, the, the focus is not on that oceanic oneness. The focus is more on the liberation of Purusha from Prakriti. In that sense, it is closer in one sense to Buddha and to the Jain Darshan on this particular point. Mm -hmm. Both the Darshans may not agree with the Vedas, the Jain and the Buddha. But on this point, they are very similar to Sankhya. And in fact, if you put it very rigorously, it is actually closer to the Jain Darshan, where the Purusha is said to be of pure awareness, the status of pure awareness. So it, that is, if you compare two darshans or how close they are on each of these points, on this particular point of enlightenment and the final goal, it's closer to the Jain darshan. Because in the Buddhist darshan, then it will be the, the final experience of an all-negating absolute, which is not the final state of Sankhya. It is closer to the Jain state of Kaival mm -hmm. Pure awareness. So when we see the Western concept of psychology, like coming to psychoanalysis, how does this discussion come to engage? Because we have a different uh, mind model there. We have different entities discussed there. Uh, quite a few as compared to what uh, Vedas and Sanatan have talked about. Do we see it from the version of Jungian collective consciousness and then we see through? What is your take on that? Um, recapturing one point which we made before, that if you look at all the schools of psychoanalysis, you can divide them into full schools, half schools, uh, quarters, uh, full schools, three quarter schools, half, half schools and quarter schools. And I said the full school would be one, which has a philosophy of its own, a metapsychology of its own, a model of mind of its own, and a clear understanding of pathology and healing of its own. Now, most schools fail this test. Mm. If you come to Sankhya, in that sense, it would be like, because it's a darshan, it has a philosophy of its own. It has a, a metapsychology of its own. It has a model of mind of its own. It's interesting to see how Sankhya model of mind goes. It's very close to the yogic model of mind. And uh, it has its own ideas about the working of the mind, about pathology and about healing. And beyond healing, what is the final state of enlightenment? So this is from one point of view, if you compare 
Psyche as a school with everything that it has with schools of psychoanalysis. Now, just as in psychoanalysis, we say we are entangled in pathology and health is in getting free from that pathology. Similarly, Sankhya also talks about entanglement in Maya and freedom from Maya. Just as we say in psychoanalysis, there is too much of id. And as Freud right, rightly said uh, about healing, where id is, their ego shall be. Mm. So Sankhya talks about similar thing, comparable, that tamas has to be reduced, which is not the same, but parallel to id. Yes. The rajas has to be optimized and the sattva has to be maximized. And sattva are those harmless, harmonious, health-giving feelings which have to be maximized. The positive feelings have to be maximized. And then he talks about uh, a very important element which is of uh, if sattva has to be maximized, rajas optimized and tamas minimized, then obviously you have to follow some process of purification. And this process of purification, uh, you can also call it catharsis and enhancement of positive psycho, positive part of the psyche. Uh, this consists primarily of two things. One is working in terms of gunas. Hmm as you find them in oneself and around you. And second is Bhuta Shuddhi. That purifying the five elements, which is an age-old tradition in India, most of the darshans would accept Bhuta Shuddhi. Purifying the earth, water, air and all those things which the five punch Bhutas. Ether, yes. And the third that he says is about using the process of observation of the Purusha and slowly detaching the Purusha from the Prakriti to the extent that the Prakriti, the thoughts stop and Prakriti stops reporting itself to you. And then would come a state where the desires don't trouble you. The desire, when the desire activates, Prakriti becomes very powerful. It is able to overwhelm the Purusha. So then it would be the next stage after the falling of thoughts, the overcoming of desires. In fact, in many stages uh, in, of uh, spiritual journey, people have realized as many times they get closer to Purusha, the Prakriti plays around and then again creates some basic desires uh, which are so repressed maybe from some past lives and it keeps on repeating itself as if there is a never-ending fountain of those basic fundamental um, uh, Prakriti gunas. Correct. So, how would one... Is it a process which takes place on its own after a period of time? Or we do something about those uh, bubbles of Prakriti playing around from the never-ending fountain and stream of gunas which uh, keep on bringing little, little things? Yeah, there are two views on this. One view is that one should do one slot and then one's own material from the past lives comes in, which one has to undergo. And then after that, it stops. Now, the point is, what if it starts coming from the universal nature? Mm, mm. Then it becomes an endless thing. So most people uh, don't get into that part. They do only work which is related to them. And then they stop doing that work and therefore the new material stops coming. This is what we are told in books. Except that mm -hmm. I have read in uh, Shirbindu and the mother that they would not stop this universal flow and they have the capacity to go on for a long time and do work of much others and much of Prakruti. So That is how uh, the, the viewpoint stands because then you are changing the environment, the Prakriti, the nature. It's correct. Like Correct. You start doing the work for on a bigger level. Correct. And one important element here of uh, uh, Sankhya is working on the Ahankar. Just mm -hmm. like we said 20 elements and 5 elements are the Purush, the Prakriti, yes. the Gunas, the Manas and the Ahankar. Ahankar is a very important element in that whole scheme of things for Sankhya. And this okay. uh, Ahankar uh, 
has to be informed with lot of purusham and slowly the ahankar has to be overcome so the purusha has to first look at the prakriti and allow it to fall the purusha then has to look at desires to some degree and allow them to fall the purusha then has to look at ahankar and this is very central to the indian way of looking at it the uh, allowing the doership to go that i am Absolutely. doing something that doership is one of the core elements in tantra the same thing comes about in the sadhana of chindamasta hmm that you sever your own head of the ego and allow the fountain of the three streams to go back to the gunas so so yeah. what we are referring here the the, the universal things and uh, frame is this is it this what jung talked about as a collective consciousness are we working there in the collective form no okay uh what we are referring to here is within our system the purusha first looks at our own thoughts so when we say prakriti individuals yeah, hmm. not the prakriti outside but inside the ceaseless flow of thoughts the ceaseless flow of sensations and so on so what would happen here is that except the observer everything in my system would become prakriti and the observer, observer is the pure consciousness that is purusha purusha except for that everything becomes prakriti ji si. so it is prakriti inside not outside so first i look at my own thoughts my own sensations my own feelings i overcome them then i look at my own desires then i look at my own ego and when i look at my own ego my ahankar the doership principle comes in and that is where we have to let go that i am not doing everything and when you loosen the hold of on that ego you are transforming the control of the system back to existence like i am the channel existence is working through me so that doing becomes like a passage of what comes from existence working itself out the i ness has been reduced the i and not i is still there but the becoming i has been reduced the i is still working you are not dead you are working mm -hmm. but working in order to become something that you are not that is gone and the control of the system is given back to the existence now this becomes a very complicated thing one of the deep 